How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and um, yes, this is yet another one of the conversations that I had face to face with people in London. And uh, in this one, I spoke to a CFA holder, a financial analyst, now turned exploration CEO, about how he looks at the financials of early stage exploration companies, how much the team you know should be getting paid, how much they should be spending on marketing promotion, and so on. And uh, of course, he he's a CEO of a company, as I said, so. He, he will obviously be promoting his own company. Again, can't really br blame him for that, I guess, um, especially considering that as it is with, uh, as I've mentioned during the, the, the previous interviews, the company behind him is paying for the room that we're recording in and all that, that the, all the rest is covered by them. I want you to know that. But again, I thought he had interesting insights to share. So if you look through that, uh, you, there is a lot of value in this conversation. So let's play that on here. So with all that said, Anthony, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Antonio. Pleasure is all mine. Uh, I was just talking to James. Actually, he brought me maple syrup. What, what did you bring me? I, uh, I didn't bring anything. <laughs> but hopefully, a, a good interview. That's a, no. That's uh, that's good. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Who are you, and why do you think you're worth listening to? Actually, because we, we've only done one interview. It was specifically focused on your company, but we haven't really spoken much before that. So, tell me about yourself first. Well, I'm Canadian. I run a small junior exploration mining company. It's called American Eagle Gold, which I think the public knows by now um why i'm worth listening to look i'm honest um give you my opinion on certain things and i think people want to learn a little bit more about our company um, mm -hmm. the markets are in really bad shape so i think right now our company with our recent news it's a bit of a beacon of light um it's a stock that's gone up it went from three cents to 32 cents it's settled at about 27 right now uh, but it stayed up there. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are are eager to see where we can go. Sure. I actually want to focus a little bit more about what you what you did before becoming the CEO of American Ego. And I was that you got the CFA program. And I want to sort of pick your brain on, on something, something among those lines. Um I'm just wondering if you if you if you were in my spot and you had to start analyzing companies here in London, there's many companies presenting. What is the first thing that you would, because it's CFA specifically to financial, I guess, what is the first thing when you open up the financial statements of a junior, what, what's the first thing that you look for? Do you look for cash, debt? What, what is it? I look at cash, working capital, and your cash burn. Okay. Um, know how much cash you have, you have enough to do your program. Um, you know, if you're not doing money on your program, how much are you spending on g and hmm. With me, uh, it bothers me when companies don't drill. There's really only one way to get value of a company is to drill um, otherwise you're just essentially waiting for the price of gold or, or copper to go up and if you're doing that you might as well invest in futures right um, you know this industry is all about making those hits and doing the 10x 20x for the investors so i want to make sure that the companies i'm investing in they're actually being proactive and looking to drill mm. finding something um, you know you look at us it's pretty well known we, we failed in nevada but if you fail you gotta fail fast and which we did and we moved on and what we could have done is we could have cried about it we could have just waited with our cash for two three years till gold went up kind of retold our story uh but we did what we did is we we brushed ourselves off and within five months of us coming out with the results in march in nevada we were already drilling again got permits everything else mm. so it shows that you know i think we had the right plan to drill and, and ended up paying off right now uh, mm -hmm. We were up 500% when, when copper was down 3%. And I said this in uh, the speech at in the London Symposium. Um, you know, good results, good properties in the metal market, they're they're inelastic. They're like alcohol, tobacco, gambling. Uh, they go up even in a bad market. So that's what's really exciting about this industry. Like you can essentially turn a company from zero to a billion dollars almost overnight. And that's why I'm in the business. I think that's why a lot of people want to invest mm. keep on following the story but so you don't necessarily think that if it's a bad market the company should put off drilling or wait because because they're like we think we're going to hit good results but what if we hit good results everybody's down like 50 percent year over year that's not really going to do anything for a share price that's a disservice to our shareholders right you, you don't subscribe to that it's not good results it's great results to really kind of turn the needle okay. we, we we had great results it all depends. Look, in a, in a down market, when people aren't drilling, drilling costs less. So you actually get more meterage and you give yourself a better chance of actually hitting that deposit. But, you know, it, it's a case by case basis, depending on how much cash you have. But, you know, for example, if you have a decent deposit and you're not sure if you're going to hit something, 
maybe you spend that time when, when the markets are down and you do some geophysics, you, you really make sure you have the best target possible, give yourself the highest probability of hitting something. Hmm. I want to go back to that cash versus burn burn rate that you said said over there. You open up a company's presentation balance sheet or something. Maybe they they have it on there. Maybe they don't. So if they don't, you go to see that or you look it up. You see how much cash they have. What's a reasonable What's a reasonable runway for the company to have? Do you want to see them having cash to do this year drilling, next year drilling, and all the GNA, or what, what are you really looking for there? I want enough cash to last you one whole calendar year. So it's December right now. I'd like you to at least last until you know December two thousand twenty three, mm -hmm. and cover you know any program that you have. I, I want to see a program in the books. Um, one of the things I, I really do kind of focus on is is how much you're paying your employees. The great thing about this industry, you can make a lot of money, but it really should, if you're in the junior business, be on upside, be on options, be on shares. Uh, you shouldn't really be taking a lot of hard dollars away from the company, away from the drilling uh, to your pocket, because you're either that way you're kind of getting a lift from both sides. Hmm. And I, you know, I'm not going to name the name. I see one company; uh, they're based in the states. Uh, you know, they're, they're they have someone in corporate development. He's getting two hundred twenty thousand U.S. a year in corporate development. Hey, I'll take that. Uh, I'll take that too. But I don't even think you need someone full time in corporate dev in any junior business. Um, so yeah, that that kind of discouraged me. So I'm like, if you're not looking after your pennies, the nickels definitely aren't being looked after either. Uh, you know, another company I see, they're based in Africa, junior company, they're, they're paying their CEO a million dollars. That money should be going into the ground. I won't mind if they make a lot of money on their options, but most cash should be going towards drilling. If you look at the ore group, uh, Stephen Stewart, our chairman, a friend of mine, I'll really respect him. What we do is we do a cost sharing approach. So we have really talented people. We have a guy named Joel Friedman. Uh, he's a CFA, a CFO. Um, he's amazing. We hired him. We actually share his costs between five, six different companies. So American Eagle Gold would never be able to afford him, but we split that cost five, six ways. So it actually costs us very little. We do the same thing for one of the most important things in this business, uh, besides the drilling and the geologist, is really your permitting. Um, the person that gets your permits, helps you work with the uh, First Nations communities, et cetera. We have a guy named Derek Teven. I think he's the best in the whole nation. He worked for Detour. He got that whole mine permitted. He worked for the Victor mine. He got that permitted for De Beers. And he works for us. And we would never be able to afford him, but we split it between six companies. And then the, kind of the secret on the street, which nobody really talks about, and there's a lot of secrets I could tell you. Um, it's not a full-time job, um, you know, working for a junior company, especially if you're a CFO or or doing community relations, et cetera. You can really spread your time across five, six different companies. And that's what we do. We have the best people who share the cost and on a per head basis, American Eagle Gold pays less than pretty much every other company. I heard something interesting during one of the presentations that me and you attended yesterday. And the person said that you should look at what the CFO, CEO are getting paid versus what the GEO, the geologist is getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, and make a ratio in between there. And if they're getting five times more money or something, then you got to ask yourself, is that is that really reasonable? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think there? Because you mentioned corporate development as well. So if it's if you can talk to me, maybe in, in terms of amounts, just, you know, broad picture, general amounts, if it's a, a hundred under one hundred million dollar market cap, the company, what should the CEO be earning? It's hundred. I, I don't really have values, but you know, I think you know, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand is a fair amount. So about ten k a month. You're happy with that? Is yeah, that going low, to twenty k a month? It gets you with options. You work for the company. You know, the shareholders are invested in you. Like you should be able to, you know, make a lot of money in your options. But again, most of those hard dollars should go on the ground. Hmm. Hmm. Look at it. Look at it. Um, we drilled our hole, uh, our first hole, and it went through, you know, high grade surface. It was great. Um, but the whole theory about our project and NAC is that we have all this disseminated ore. We have a huge resource at surface. Um, but what we theorize is this is all getting fed from some stock underneath. And that's why we did the, the deep drilling, because we wanted to hit that, that high grade stock that's coming from somewhere. We still don't really know what we have here. But we drilled down to 950 meters. In the last 30 meters, we actually hit the super high grade zone. I believe it was 17 meters of, of over 2%. Mm. That extra 30, 50 meters, you know, that is what, $12,000. So every $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 you save really could be the difference between actually finding that and not finding that, which is really important.
So if the company has five newsletter writers and they're paying each of them 10K a month, you're just, you're not going to touch it. It's it's not sustainable. Um, you know, those are all short-term pops. People will read through it. All people need right now in this market are great results, great results, which we had. But, you know, you can have a news news writer, newsletter writer, um, you know, it'll give you an unsustainable short-term pop, but it's going to come back to where it was before. Hmm. Um, it's a pretty efficient market. People are pretty smart out there. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. you mentioning insider ownership. That's an interesting one, too. I watched, um, I don't remember what royalty or company was, but they, they analyze their companies and they want to see uh, that the value of the insider ownership is at least two years worth of salary. Mm-hmm. And they give the company time, the, the company CEO or something to do that. Uh, and it's per person. So if, you, if, if you're making 200K a year or 250, they want you to have invested at least a half a million dollar in your own company. Is that a reasonable? Would you ever look at that? Does that matter in your opinion? What do you think? I never really thought about that, to be honest. Everyone has a different financial situation, especially in this market right now. Everyone's portfolios are down. It's it's tough to put that much money into anything. Uh, you know, I've, I've invested myself. I put my kids' RSP uh, money into it. So I certainly believe that you should be buying stock. But I think more importantly, you shouldn't be selling stock. The moment I see an insider sell stock, I think that's my time to sell because if they don't think it's valuable to hold on to, none of the public should either. Fear, but in some ways, I guess they also they get paid in, in options, and mm-hmm. so for some of them, that's just a way to take out you know their paycheck out of the company because you said they should load them up with options. But if you you know if you put them on, on you know a five k paycheck a, a month and a bunch of options, well, they're going to have to start exercising those options eventually. It's going to it's going to show up as as, as selling. So I guess, but you, you sell the shares like you're still you're still flagging to the market for whatever reason that you, you think that it's a fair value or even overvalued if you're selling. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, everyone does have a, a different reason. I'm not going to judge it. But, you know, that was kind of the philosophy that I have. And they had the company I worked at before. OK, OK. And that's that's all smaller companies that we are we are talking about here. Does market cap matter, by the way, because we I said small companies under one hundred million dollars. Um Sometimes it's under 50 really small companies. Do you think that someone who, you know, a company with a higher market cap should be paying their CEO more? And if it's a smaller com- market cap, less? Well, yeah, if you have a big company, multi-billion dollar company, you're you're in charge of a lot of people. The bigger the market cap, probably the more employees you have, the more responsibility you have, the more you have to travel. Um, so, yeah, you probably should get paid a little bit more. Um, but I think people that get should get paid the most in hard dollars are, are really the technical people, the geologists. They're really... The reason why you're going to make that discovery. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about um, major miners. So I, I worked at a major mining company. And one of the issues was the projects team. It's really hard to find people that are able to successfully build a mine. But one of the problems at, at my old company is that to find someone that can really build a mine, they're going to be hired by Rio Tinto, BHP, and they're paid millions and millions of dollars, Freeport, et cetera. But a lot of companies cannot get it in their head that you have to pay sometimes the projects guys, the person in charge that mine more money than what the CEO gets paid. Um, but HR can't get their head around that. And they're actually don't actually hire the best people possible. So you see a lot of these mid tier uh, mining companies based in Canada, and they just haven't been successful in terms of building their mines. And, and the reason is they don't have the right people. Mm-hmm. I also want to go back to something that you previously said that you would look at the g so you're looking for the cash versus burn rate. You tell me 12 months of runway, that's good. What about some red flags? Companies like hiding things in the g and uh, what, what are red flags that you, that you would see as a CFA that I wouldn't be able to see? I think you'd be able to see everything I can see. I, I, it's not like I'm better at finance because I have my CFA. It's, a, it's because I was able to, I'm a good test writer. I spent a lot of time studying for it. It's been over 600 hours, uh, sorry, 600 hours per test. But the CFA doesn't say you're better than anything it just shows a future employer this person has the ability to learn x or le- learn y mm-hmm. uh and it's a rite of passage um but you know what's a red flag you know i know one company based in quebec uh they owe 18 so there's a certain number of royalties patents that they have and they owe fifty thousand dollars per patent to one of their one of the board members so they're essentially paying their board member royalty for the property that they have that's a red flag for me. Um, you know, things like people taking a big salary, they don't actually pay them cash. They don't have cash. Then you kind of reissuing that in, in shares. That's a red flag. 
uh, how much are you paying for your your office space? Uh, you know, as, as a junior company, you can basically almost work out of your your basement. I wouldn't really advise on it, but you shouldn't be paying a lot of money on, on office space. Mm-hmm. Again, like I, I really emphasize, the only way you actually create sustainable value is making a great discovery, which I believe we we have so far. But you got to put as many meters as possible into the ground. And one of the reasons why we left Nevada, it's not because we didn't like the property. It was a great property. It's right next to Cortez. I believe there is a deposit there. Um, but what we discovered in Nevada, it, it costs like five or six times the price to drill in Nevada as it does in Canada. Um, they must have a really good tobacco lobbyist working for Nevada or something. Because what's crazy is that we went in there and we thought this is the best place in the world to be right now. Um, you know, Fraser Institute has it uh, as, as number one or, or number two. And w- when we got in there, we quickly realized Nevada is not a great place for an exploration company. Uh, again, making a discovery is all about putting as many meters in the ground as possible. And if you're behind the eight ball and it costs you five times as much to drill, you might as well be on the moon or, or in the DRC looking for something. And Nevada is a great place to be if you're bear, if you're Newmont and you're actually producing gold, but it's a very challenging place to be if you're actually exploring. Extremely, extremely costly to drill. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's tough ground. It's hard to keep open. Uh, also, like Barrick and Newmont, essentially, they have to replace all of the production they have. It's over three and a half million ounces a year, which means they have to put as much money into brownfields as possible to replace reserves. And they have control pretty much of all the drillers. Mm-hmm. So it matters what the company's paying per meter of drilling. That's that's a question that you should be asking or at least calculating at the end of the year when you see the when you see the results. And the higher that cost is, the higher the probability of the company failing is. Does that does that make any sense? Um I guess like the higher the cost is, the less meters you put in the ground. And you know, the more meters you put in the ground, the better chance you have of hitting something. Um, I guess if you've already found something. Um, you know, where you're, where you're drilling is a little bit easier because when you're doing an exploratory drill program, there's a good chance a lot of your holes will be misses. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure you have as many, you know, holes as possible until you kind of find that deposit. Mm-hmm. But what you want to look at is, you know, how much are you paying per meter? How much is the program coming up next year or the year after? And you kind of extrapolate how much money that company may need to raise down the line. To figure that out and then you add the gna to oh that might be an interesting too gna to drilling ratio i mean m- meaning how, m- how much money did you spend on drilling and how much money did you spend on your on your gna is there is there a range there that you can tell me like you, you spend at least twice as much on drilling than you do on gna or is it much higher than that yeah we I, i've never really thought about that we just try and keep our gna as small as possible and uh, you know, put as many meters in the ground. But I've never looked at anything like a ratio to try and figure mm. that out. But it's a good thing to maybe look at if you're analyzing companies. Mm. For sure, I never even thought about that. So, okay, yeah, that might be an interesting thing. I I I like making all these ratios because they make sense in my head, and it, it, they give me like a certainty of okay, you're doing something, and it's also easy because you can write them down. But it's not it's not always that easy. Sometimes there's exceptions, I guess, where you. You might have to pay more for something or make, pay more in a certain place than you would in another place and stuff like that. So that's uh, that's that. If you're drilling somewhere else, it costs more to drill. You better have a lot a lot better target and a lot better probability of hitting something right off the bat. So if, I, if I'm in DRC, I, I better be pretty sure that I'm going to be hitting into a copper system. Hmm. Uh, the one the first drill holes. Why is that? What do you mean? Well, you know, you're in the DRC or, or country, you know, in Africa or, or a place where you could lose your property. If you want to take those risks, you better have a pretty good idea you're going to actually find something. Mm. You lost the property once. Years ago, that was before I joined, but uh, the company got started as a private company. Uh, they're based in Papua New Guinea. They actually had a great property, which we actually still have a royalty on. Um, mm. But yeah, look, Papua New Guinea's uh, never been there. They, uh, they took the property away. We lost it. And it kind of... It was a bit of a lesson to our group. What what's the lesson? We stay in Canada. Stay that's it. You stay where you stay where you know. Canada is the best place in the entire world um, to be drilling, to be producing. Once you have a property, land, no one's gonna ever gonna take it away from you. Might be a little bit more um, challenging on, on the permitting side. But I think it's challenging for people that aren't, aren't from the country. But you know, we've only had really good experiences so far in American Eagle Gold. We work with the Lake Babine Nation, the they're the indigenous community uh, where our property is. And my very first order of business when we got NAC was to call the community up. 
Mm. I'm Tony. This is our company. This is what we want to do. But I said, if you guys don't want us here, I don't want to be here. And, you know, I think they really did appreciate that. And I treat our relationship with the community, the Lake Babby Nation, kind of how I treat my relationship at home with my wife. It's all about being transparent. Uh, and it's all about communication. And if you do that, you'll get along. And, you know, the, the First Nations, the Indigenous communities in Canada, they all want the same thing. They want two things, the same things we want. We want prosperity and we want sustainability. So if you have a partner that will make sure that you're doing something in a sustainable way, you have a lot better chance of success. And I believe we really have a great team. And I really do care about the people there in the community. I believe, you know, this could be a mine someday. And I want to make sure that we do create prosperity. Um, yeah. But I think Rick Rowe might disagree with you on the jurisdiction thing. He's made Robert Friedland too. They, uh, I mean, you mentioned the DRC. He's uh, he's made a lot of money for a lot of people in the DRC. And, and Rick Rowe says that, um, he finds it funny how people uh, don't like it when foreign governments steal from them, but when your person, when your own government steals from you, and tough in terms in, in terms of taxes and, and whatever that, that he means, people are okay with that. What, what do you think he? What do you what do you think he means by that? He does have some experience, so that that's for them. I just could never see myself going to to China, to Russia, to to any of those places. Um, there's some weird ways. I think some people are able to get properties. Um, but that's just not for us. Uh, it works for some companies. It's just that's not something we want to kind of explore. So if you if you if you if you had to go work, you had to use your degrees. If you had to go, you know, be an analyst or something, some place else, your life depended on it. You had to put a portfolio together. You would start looking in Canada, and you just not go out go out of Canada. I mean, to to look for even for diversification purposes. There's not great properties in in Canada. I think that you could really fill up your portfolio, but. You know, I, I probably put a couple other countries in there. Um, you know, South, countries in South America are good, Australia, um, you know, even in some areas of, of Europe. Um, mm. It's really kind of a case-by-case -case basis. If you were to build your own portfolio, though, um, and I'm assuming, do, do you invest in, do you, do you invest in other, other natural resource companies, by the way, yourself, like with your own portfolio? I invest in a few, uh, mostly in the ore group. Um, mm. We really do have great companies, great assets, and great people. Um, you just interviewed uh, James Sykes. I invest in in baseload. I invested in metal energy. Um, it's a pretty good idea what's going on there, and I do believe in, in them and, and where they are in terms of jurisdiction. But in, in terms of portfolio, what do I invest in? Look, if you're investing in anything, talk to your investment advisor. Do not listen to me. Um, I do not give financial advice. But you know what I do, for example, have X amount of money in cash, certain amount of money in, in physical gold, uh, have uh, invest in you know. New York Stock Exchange ETF, uh, and then maybe, you know, one or two actual major producers, something like a Barrick or Franklin Nevada Gold, uh, they think are still undervalued, have a lot of room to go. And if you want to put some torque into your portfolio, you know, put maybe a small percentage into a junior mining company. And that's what I'm going after. I'm going after the investors. And what I'm trying to fight for is fight for their 3%, their 5% portfolio. They want to put in a super risky asset um, but that has a lot of torque. So all of a sudden, you know, if you invest in American Eagle Gold and another company that goes 5X, 10X, that really kind of improves your whole portfolio. Mm. Um, so I always say this, you know, finding a great deposit or even great junior company is like finding a, a needle in the haystack. Um, what my job is, what we try and do is we try and make that haystack as small as possible. It give us the best probability of success. Mm -hmm. it, that's a good point, though, because and I think that's a fair warning, too, because it's... Um, Failure is the norm here in this space, basically. Mm -hmm. So odds are against you from the get go. You can try and diminish it, but they are most of the time they're going to stay against you. So I guess spreading the risk would also make sense for natural resource investors. Uh, it would make sense when it comes down to the pre discovery companies, but it also probably makes sense to diversify into some companies that already have a discovery or have a DFS or something along those lines. That's something you would do, or do you not see value there? Depends. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, having a, a company that has other catalysts coming up, example, a resource or, or PEA or, or PFS. Yeah. Like that's, that's probably a good investment philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. It's this, it's the spread there. It's just, I think I'm sort of, I've gotten a little bit of, afraid of that because I loaded up my portfolio in, in a FOMO manner. I FOMO'd into most of my positions, maybe didn't do, do, do the proper research or enough research where I had to a bunch of juniors, they're super volatile. 
my portfolio is down 40%. Mm -hmm. And for example, I have to make a, a big expense right now that I didn't foresee or something. I mismanaged my my personal mm -hmm. money, for example. And now I have to take it out. I'm taking a big loss there, maybe mm -hmm. because I didn't have the, the proper the proper risk spreading there. So I'm just I'm just wondering how how you would approach it with someone with, you know, like many more years of experience and also the, the financial background as well. Because that's a it's a unique combination too. So that's why I'm asking you these questions. Would how how would you how would you make sure not to FOMO into something then? If it's a if, if they already have a DFS or something, are you going to be looking at the 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 the, the NAV, the MPV, you know, so the internal rate of return, or is it something else that you want to pull out of those uh, reports? If you really want to make money in this space, you have to identify the companies that are really not getting any attention, not getting any volume, and then you have to find little you know the tea, green the tea leaves for opportunities. I'll talk about our our company um, for example. If you followed American Eagle Gold and you knew about it, and I asked for meetings all the time, I couldn't even get meetings before November 7th. But if you followed us closely, um, what you would have known from a press release before was that we didn't have enough money to extend our drill program. When we did our first drill hole, we saw from the XRF that we really hit something great. We had a million and a half dollars to spend that we got through flow through, but that only gave us about four holes. But we said we want to get extended to seven. That's what the original drill program was. We need about a million dollars. Uh, to raise a million dollars with our two and a half million dollar market cap, do you, know, do you know what it cost us? We dilute our shareholders by like 50%. And we said, we're not doing that. We we think we're extremely undervalued, but there's no way for us to lift the value because we can't come out with assays. It takes about 12 to 14 weeks to come out with assays, which is a real problem. So we said, we need a million dollars. How are we going to do it? And what Joel Friedman and Steve uh, Stewart did, were very smart individuals, they created this exotic financing. So what they did is we sold 20% of NAC to ore finders. Uh, in exchange for a million dollars. And with that a million dollars, uh, we were able to extend our drill program. But also we made an agreement with them that we can actually pay them back 50% more than the million dollars we gave us. So pay them back a million and a half dollars for that 20% within 18 months. Now, what that did for our shareholders was, for example, if we raise money right now for a million dollars, um, we'd only dilute our shareholders for that same amount, you know, about five to 7%. We did it before it was 50%. So we actually saved our shareholders a lot of money. Not that we're going to raise money now. I still think we're undervalued. Now, getting back to the point, if I was actually following the company, I would say, well, heck, these guys don't have any results out. They're waiting. Uh, they must have XRFs. Everyone kind of has an idea of what their results are going to be. But I said, wow, like Orfiners gave them a million dollars. Think about this. If you're doing any due diligence on anything, you're able to lift the Komodo. You're able to see you know, into your data room. So if Orfiners gave them a million dollars, they must see something in this company or this asset to know for sure that they're going to get that million and a half dollars down the road. And as an investor, if I saw that, that would be, that would be green flags invest in this company because there's something good coming up. Hmm. And I guess what I'm saying is you really got to pay attention to the financials, the news, et cetera, because you really can't give yourself uh, an advantage. The problem is you got 5,000 different companies that you have to wade through. Uh, but people did invest at that three, four cent level. Um, and they made a lot of money doing it. Yeah, I even know someone who did it. So um, I'm kind of jealous I didn't do it. Well, even uh, so, and, and just to back up here, like another thing is we came up with that news on November 7th at 6 a.m. So somebody had three and a half hours to really analyze it. Even once the markets open at 930, the stock didn't really start moving for an hour, hour and a half. So people came in at the four cent level again, still made a lot of money. So there is a bit of an arbitrage to still take advantage of the inefficiency in the market, people not knowing it's out there. I uh, One individual, he's part of the YMP, really smart guy. I'm not going to name his name, but he's a young guy. He actually called me at 7.30 in the morning, an hour and a half after he came out of that news release, and we did a call with him. So he he went through all the different things about the whole. And what he did for his company, he actually put it on the morning, the morning news uh, for his bank. So actually people at that bank actually knew about this and started investing before everyone else did. And it kind of shows you, uh, you know, how smart this individual is and the fact that he kind of noticed it and took the time to talk to me, which no one else really did. Yeah. I guess that's easier though, for someone who's doing this professionally and they can get to present to it. And if I'm like, if I'm a baker yeah. and, you know, yeah. baking croissants in the morning at five o'clock, I don't have time to do that. Um, what what I would see though, because you said, you know, ore finders, um, you know, the ore group, uh, gave you gave you that million. They they gave it to you, but they're they're expecting fifty percent more. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this as a, just a normal person who, you know, I I can really do too complicated math, but I know you know half a million uh, on top of that is fifty percent more. Mm -hmm. This looks to me like a pretty you know a, a pretty steep interest on a loan. Is that not right to look at it that way? No, it's not right. So 
a million dollars again would have cost 50 percent dilution so our, our market cap was at you know 2.5 million let's call it 2 million so to get another million we would have had to issue x amount of shares so let's just do the math real quick 69 million shares on standing times you know we would have had to issue around 35 million shares mm. right to get that million dollars what's 35 million shares right now at this this current price mm. what is it it's about eight million dollars mm. so actually instead of paying an extra seven million dollars we actually only have to pay an extra five hundred thousand. So it actually was really good for the shareholders. Okay, so you look at it in terms of well, that's a, that th this is good information, right? Think you, you look at it on a case per case basis, and uh, and you ask yourself, what what are the other options? Because you're, you're either not drilling, you're paying the fifty percent, or you're paying with a dilution. And that's how you figure it out. Okay, I think this is good. Uh, and, this is and again, like those last three drill holes are going to tell a lot. Like that's that allows us to reanalyze everything and actually have a better drill program next year. So that last drill hole allows us to another step out to the north. We've actually extended our whole footprint, you know, to 750 meters almost, and allows us to actually do a step out uh, towards the east to drill west to see how how much we how much we increase uh, laterally. So um, those three drill holes were really important, and I believe it's going to pay off for investors. Hmm. Okay. How about at the end of my questions here? Is there something that you came here hoping to talk about, but I didn't bring up? Um, no, you asked a lot of good questions. I appreciate you talking to us. Um, you know, there's an expression about a tree falling in the woods. Um, there's no one around doesn't even make a sound. Hmm. Uh, I believe we have something great here. I think we have the tiger by the tail. Uh, my job right now is to let, let people know that American Eagle Gold exists. Tell them about NAC. Because uh, one thing having great property is another thing having investors know that you exist so they can invest in you. So right now I want to have as many people know American Eagle Gold, know me, and know NAC. And I appreciate you, you know, allow me to have that platform to to speak to the investors out there. It's 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 easy talking about a great project. So my life's fun. It's easy, um, and we have a really great team. And I'm really excited about the future. I appreciate you investing your time. Thanks, Antonio.